Perhaps the most visible paradox created by water constraints in the Bear River is that wetlands are irrigated through a system of canals and dikes, making refuge managers essentially wetland farmers. Upon its establishment in 1928, refuge managers had to secure and utilize water rights and begin constructing water control structures and subdividing the wetland complex into units. Every year, managers determine how much water they expect to see during the summer and which wetland units they think need to be kept wet. As water becomes scarce towards the end of the irrigation season, they actually let some units go dry and actively manage water levels in others. There is nothing natural about this water management and there is no interest in mimicking the Bear River hydrology of 200 years ago. Instead, because wildlife propagation is the purpose which justifies the refuge's water use, managers aim to maximize the amount and types of waterfowl habitat available. This is duck production at its finest. This system of water management, while unusual, is effective enough that it has been used in other refuges along the river. Refuges upstream of the Bear River Migratory Bird Refuge also seek to exercise maximum control over water within their particular sets of constraints in order to create the best possible waterfowl habitat. Ironically, these other wildlife refuges most with smaller, more junior water rights, who are no water rights at all, generally have a more secure water supply because of their advantageous geographic position in relation to agricultural and hydropower water uses. Managers at the Bear River Refuge have built unlikely alliances with irrigators and the hydropower company. Common perception suggests that these interests are at odds with one another. However, history plays out differently in the Bear River watershed. Refuge managers recognize that their late summer water supply is dependent on either deliveries of agricultural storage water or return flows from agricultural flood irrigation. Each of these is dependent upon the connections between irrigators and the power company. Because of this, refuge managers have built relationships with other water users to help ensure that they can exercise flexibility in use of water. These unlikely alliances mean that wildlife agencies face the same threats to their water supply as these other water users. This situation has led to three related paradoxes. The first of these paradoxes is that the Fish and Wildlife Service has joined irrigators in supporting a dam in the lower reaches of the Bear River. A reservoir would give the refuge its own storage water to maintain stable wetlands throughout the summer. Depending on where the storage reservoir is built and how water released from it is delivered to users, refuge managers see a potential opportunity to enhance corridors of riparian wetland habitat that would link fish and wildlife service refuges with larger wetland complexes. A second paradox is that the Fish and Wildlife Service opposes the transfer of water from what is perceived to be more consumptive agricultural uses to less consumptive uses like municipal and industrial use that provide no return flow for wetlands. Who would have thought that increased irrigation efficiency actually threatens the water supply of some wetlands? Information technologies have allowed the irrigation companies to better monitor and coordinate water deliveries, diversions, and applications. Consequently, they waste a smaller portion of agricultural water. However, due to Western water law, water that is not wasted is either stored for later use or becomes available for the next in line legal priorities. 
As rights to water become fully allocated and utilized, wetlands that formerly relied on irrigation inefficiencies will be left high and dry. Wetland managers will need to obtain legal water rights and work out agreements with other water users to get the water that they need. The third paradox is that in adapting to agricultural uses of water, wildlife refuges have become linked to various sources of vulnerability in agricultural production. Agricultural adaptations to drought have not always yielded the effects originally anticipated. Irrigators downstream of Bear Lake with a more secure source of storage water developed agricultural production systems that were different and more reliant on water than irrigators upstream of Bear Lake. Ironically, this has left irrigators below Bear Lake more susceptible economically to the effects of subsequent droughts. This poses additional risks to the refuge that is located downstream of all these irrigators and that depends on their irrigation return flows. Locality helps to explain these paradoxes. The locations of the wetlands in this hydro-ecological human river system influences how refuge managers have chosen to adapt to scarce water supplies. Similarly, the location of more powerful interests downstream and outside of the Bear River watershed encourages unlikely alliances within the watershed. There is a contextualized rationality involved in the way people have organized their relationships with the environment and with each other. However, this rationality is one framed by human logic, not necessarily ecological logic. One lesson from this case study is that the nature of ecological and human vulnerabilities changes over time and within particular contexts. The rationality of adaptation in Bear River Watershed has been built on a pre-climate change reality. Climate change introduces new uncertainties and reveals how, in attempting to exercise greater control over scarce water supplies, we have become ever more vulnerable to the limitations of our own knowledge. The way people have adapted to the arid and drought-prone hydrology of the Bear River watershed places great onus on their ability to discern which uses, which wetlands, which lakes, and which birds need water, at what times, and at what consequences over the long term. A second lesson is that we cannot assume efficiency is good without carefully, thoughtfully, and consistently juxtaposing it with equity concerns. Individual actions must be understood within a contextualized reality whereby people come to know and to care about individual wetlands as part of wetland complexes and all uses in relation to each other. Terry Tempest Williams, an environmental writer with a deep connection to the Bear River Migratory Bird Refuge, writes, Our sense of community and compassionate intelligence must be extended to all life forms, plants, animals, rocks, rivers, and human beings. This is the story of our past, and it will be the story of our future. She describes a politics of place, where people are deeply accountable to their interconnected social and ecological world. 
as the future brings changes to the Bear River watershed, people must remember their connections to the river, to the wildlife, and to each other in order to preserve not only the wetlands, but themselves as well. <laughs>